if someone does something altruistic, as in they donate money, they support a good cause, but they do it in pursuit of recognition and the any the benefits that would bring, is that still altruism or is that selfish? This is a really complicated way. In fact, there's a really interesting story, actually. I think it's an old uh, a Jewish fable, and it's one of the, the local village elders says that they want to donate a lot of money to an orphanage. And they go and speak to the rabbi about this, and the rabbi says, great idea, you know, think about it, go and do it. Think about your reasons for doing this. And the, the gentleman goes away and thinks about it and comes back you know, weeks later and says, I actually only realised I was doing this for purely selfish reasons, and I'm no longer going to do that because I know that I was only donating the money to make myself feel good. And the rabbi replied, do you think the orphans care? So that's another one. If you are only donating something or being altruistic or doing something good out of a selfish desire for your own, you know, validation, should that stop you when the people you're helping would still be helped by it? Can you be an egotistical altruist? And this is... Philosophers have debated this for centuries, guys, absolutely years. It's been ridiculous that people have not come to an answer on this because this is... The, what we're talking about is the core of human nature here. Is anything ultimately ever selfish? I mean, one thing that I want to do is I would love to be in a position where I could help fund uh, some local amateur dramatics theatre. And the reason for this is I've been involved in amateur dramatics theatre for a lot of my life, and I've seen so many productions suffer because of lack of funding, whether it's uh, government local funding, whether it's the... the people involved, the kids or the parents donating money to a cause, raising money for this. I mean, I've been in shows and the kids have had amazing times, but the problem is that we haven't had the money to buy them costumes. We haven't been able to rent microphones for them. And sometimes you've only had, you know, 50 quid, 100 pounds. Someone, I've been, you could turn on Run when you're not busy. Darcy, Run is on now. But I've been involved in amateur dramatic stuff where we've said, oh, we haven't got 200 pounds to build this stuff. We've got to have people's labour, volunteers being pulled in. You've got to spend endless nights trying to source cardboard, paint, paintbrushes, wood, costumes, all that kind of stuff. It would be so much more beneficial if some random, you know, supporter of theatre just walked up and said, hey, here's some money, go and put a show on. That'd be great. And I would love to be in a position in the future to be able to do that. However, this is another internal question, another internal struggle. And I've... I've very much made it a point with myself to not hide how I feel about a lot of these situations from you guys, because if I didn't have an audience, I wouldn't have a job. A lot of people support me on Patreon in order to facilitate the creation of the videos, to facilitate me turning down sponsorships. And oh my God, I have been able to turn down so many sponsorships, uh, thankfully, because of the, the Patreon support. If I suddenly turned around to a local Amdram group and I'm like, hey, you guys need some money, here's 200 quid, go and do what you want with it. Would they support that? How much... How much... Loyalty do I owe the Patreons to only use the money for the creation of the content that they want? compared to creating the content which sustains the channel and using any benefits of that to altruistically support arts in the community? That is a question that I still don't know the answer to. I don't think any of us will know the answer to. It's, it's a complicated way of doing it. Charity stream for this kind of thing and then do that with the money. Hell yeah, we could do that at some point. That could be interesting. Use a poll to determine the ratio. Yeah. Hey, turn up the show, then make, make a video about the show, could work. There's, there's a way to do it. There's definitely an interesting balance of this to, uh, to find somewhere. I don't know what it is. Simple, you give us joy, bring something that gives you joy. As long as you're doing your due diligence and video making, you should... It's interesting. It is so interesting. I love... Because uh, it's that dissonance between what you're paying for, what you're getting, what's it being used for. I don't think patron supporters should expect their fund to be directly invested into production. We give you money so you don't have to worry about making a full-time job. I mean, I'm going to be real. The, the amount of emails that I've got recently over mobile game adverts, and don't get me wrong, these are absurd amounts of money that they're offering, which makes me replying no much funnier every time. But 
I've had people come to me and been like, you're an absolute goddamn idiot for not taking that. And I've said, it's think about this long term. Because again, it's uh, it's a it's a long term thing. Because I like to think that I'm not a fool. But if I don't consider every eventuality, every point, that would be foolish in itself. If I were to take a sponsorship, yes, that would be a large instant lump sum of money. But that would annoy people who have supported the philosophy that I've created videos with for a long time, and therefore they would unsubscribe from the Patreon, they would unsubscribe from YouTube Premium, they would unsubscribe from Twitch, and over a long enough time period, the money lost from that continued support would become greater than the lump sum gained from taking the sponsorship. Which means it's a financially sound decision to just create content that people like in a way they like it. That's It sounds so simple when you say it that way, but I've had so many business meetings when I used to work in you know the, the big world of real business of people sitting down being like, how can we trick our customers into giving us more money? How can we convince people? Where should we put the adverts? How should we make the store smell? What can we do to manipulate profits? And I kind of just thought, why don't you just make a good product in a way that people enjoy supporting over a long time period? I understand that it's not going to be the best you know, money short term, but it's going to be consistent and it's going to at least, you know, work. Long time. There we go. It's, it's a very simple way of doing it. Make a product that people like allow them to support you in a way that they agree with and do that for a long time. And the reason that people don't do that is exactly as you've put in the chat, it's harder than tricking people. It's very easy to trick someone. It's very hard to convince someone that they have been tricked. Yeah. Reminds me of your philosophy towards short-term, long-term rewards and MMOs. Long-term rewards can work. In theory, accepting those sponsorships would be shooting yourself in the foot because Patreon members would leave. I would then need to accept more sponsorships in the future to make up for this, and it would just swell. But this is a very important thing as well. I need people to understand that I am in no way speaking negatively about any content creator that does accept any sponsorships that go their way. More power to them. You know, take the money, spend it on what you like, live the life you want to live. I watch a load of YouTubers and lots of them have sponsored segments in their videos. There is no negativity toward those people whatsoever. It's just not something that I personally vibe with well enough to want to do it all the time. I mean, I will take, um, I'll take the Guild Wars 2 stuff. I'll take the RuneScape stuff. You know, I'll take the Albion Online stuff, games that I play. Because it's very important to me that if someone walks up to me and says, hey, you, you did a sponsorship for this, can you stand by them? It's very important to me that I can say yes. So I only try and take stuff that I can stand by. Interesting. We pay for a Patreon Twitch, sir, because we enjoy it. Uh, Lamelia, invest in your content. But if you continue putting up video stream, continue to support it. That's the way I see it. I don't see it as anything more complicated than that. I I have a very, very old, apparently an old school way of looking into to business, which is create something people like. You know how I dislike that? I think this comes back to it. You know how I very much dislike that MMOs try and trick you into spending money with microtransaction shops, and I dislike battle passes, and I dislike, you know, one-week pre-order editions, and I dislike the proprietary currency. And the reason I dislike all of this is simply because it is attempting to manipulate you to give more money to the company. And they're putting effort not into creating the best content, but into getting the most out of you. I very much like it when a game says, here is a game, if you like it, here is how you can give us money, and we will make more game. Old School RuneScape is not even um, free of this. There are bonds. I'm not a massive fan of Old School RuneScape bonds. I totally get why they're in them, but I can't always defend them, and I wouldn't even try to defend them. What I very much like, for example, Vampire Survivors. Vampire Survivors, here's a game, give us money, here's the whole game. Fantastic. What a brilliant, brilliant way of doing it. Oh, you've made uh, you made two sequels, fantastic, I'll buy both of them. The reason I'll buy both of them pretty much immediately is because you've made more of what I wanted, you've charged a fair price for it, here is some more money, fantastic. I approach making content in the same way that I would want someone to approach making a game and monetizing it. 
I will make the content. If you like the content, give what you can. I'll make more. You might not be in a position where you can give any. Not a problem. There are no premium videos. There's no premium special, you know, subs only Twitch streams. There's nothing else there. Just make a product, put it out there. Seems to work. And I'm going to keep doing it. And people call me old for it. But I'm going to keep doing it because it works for me and it's simple. And I'm a I'm very simple, smooth brain YouTuber. Don't think super complicated stuff. Someone said to me yesterday, um, <laughs> I was talking to a business guru. And they were like, so Josh, what do your Patreons get? Do they get early access to videos? They get, uh, you know, special things? They get nothing. Okay, what, what do you mean nothing? He, he could not understand. He could not get his mind around that. I'm like, they just like the fact that I don't take sponsorships. And they like the videos and sometimes people have got a pound a week, pound a month spare. Makes them happy. Keeps the dogs fed. And it, it blew his mind that I was... I, I don't think that he could understand that there was a transaction that was that simple. Big fan of your videos. Want to know what the process was for making the long-form analysis videos like Baldur's Gate and how you worked on writing to produce that quality. Red, first of all, uh, thank you for being a first-time chatter. It's lovely to have you here. I will tell you, uh, the way that I was able to make good videos was for a long time making very bad videos. That's the best way to do it. I made good videos by being terrible for a long, long time. So your 50th script might be quite good. Your first one will be bad, but you have to write the first one to get to the 50th. So I wrote a script and I watched it and I watched my own videos. And I'm like, that's bad. But why is it bad? Maybe it's too slow. Maybe it's not analytical enough. Maybe it's too analytical. There are areas to improve here. So I went to people that I watch on YouTube. I reached out. I'm like, hey, what am I doing wrong? And I listened to the advice. And eventually I became slightly better. I started off terrible at making good videos. Then I got okay at making okay videos. And now I think I'm okay at making quite good videos. That's pretty much it. But my process mostly is is play a game, write down everything of any relevance, and then work out whether it's worth putting that into a sentence in a script or not. Yeah, fail fast, fail hard, fail better, man. Make enough garbage, it piles up and gets you onto a pedestal. Everyone sees the guy juggling plates. No one sees the piles of smashed plates behind them. That's what it is. Everyone sees your success. No one sees your trials and tribulations to get to that success. So if you... If you want to see that success, fail hard, fail fast, fail as many times as you possibly can. I would rather work with someone who has failed more times than they can possibly remember, because when I say, hey, we should do this, they'll be able to say to me, no, we shouldn't, because, and then they'll give me a reason why that would fail. Okay, fantastic. What if he was using plastic plates? Coward. Only juggle with porcelain plates. Gala, good evening to you. First time after watching the uh, video, uh, the sponsors were not ready for me. Really loving the past 10 minutes. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the, the truth is, that video was genuine. People have messaged me about that whole sponsor video going, oh, you, you come across as really arrogant. You know, I can't believe that you're so rude to these people. You have to understand there is a different energy that you need to approach a business chat with than just a friendly chat. If it was just a friend wanting to have a chat with me, of course I would talk to them, no problem at all. The problem is that I get maybe seven or eight business inquiries a day, and if I was to give every single business inquiry just 15 minutes of my time, I'm spending two hours a day talking to business people that I don't necessarily want to work with. The problem is I need, I need to almost filter out the companies that I don't want to work with very quickly. And I can't be super nice all the time to businesses. People, no problem at all. You know, you walk up to me at a convention, you drop me a message, person, not a problem. All the time in the world for you, as much as I can find. Businesses, I will straight away go into, what do you need? What can I supply you? What can I get from you? What do you need? But no, the, the kind of energy that I, I, fo I, I use when I approach those things is... As much as it is fun just to, you know, chat with people and just, you know, shoot the shit for a couple of minutes before you start talking business, I value my time to be able to create content that the Patreons are paying for. So when I sit down with the business, I straight away go, right, what do you need? What can I do? And they're like, oh, do you want to, you know, just have a quick catch up? No. What do you need? Can I do it? Can I not do it? Let's work this out quickly. The faster we can work this out, the better. 
So I'm I'm generally pretty quick when I'm talking about businessy stuff. And I've actually had companies and individuals thank me for that. But that's how you lose money. Is it, though? Because if I wasn't ever interested in taking that sponsorship anyway, I'm not bothered about losing it. If a company comes to me and says, we love your stuff, and I'm like, okay, cool. What do you love? And they go, oh, we don't actually watch your stuff. I'm thinking, oh, okay, cool. So we've started our our business relationship with a lie, have we? We've started it with just blowing smoke up my ass. You want to put me in this position? And I've had people, I've had people give the cookie cutter answers before. I say, oh, what do you love? And they've gone, oh, we just love how you tell it like it is. We love how you're just so real, you know? We love how you just, you make the videos and they get well received and people like them and they love how you, how you stuff. And I'm just sat there thinking, you have no idea, do you? You are just giving me the most generic answer. You're giving me Barnum answers. That's what they are. Has anyone looked into that, the psychology effect of what are called Barnum tests or Barnum questions? It's where you just say generic statements that could apply to basically anyone. Uh, the Barnum statements. People say to me, oh, this is not a good way to make money. This is, you are losing money by doing this. Okay. I'm, I'm willing to lose the money if otherwise it's going to be... Um, a difficult business working relationship because I don't want that. Just because you ca- you say some scientific term doesn't mean you actually understand them. Like what you're doing right now. Ah, oh, rookie. Thank you, May. I was just thinking. Oh, I've not got enough content to cover the next twenty minutes. Here we go. Come on, rookie. Let's have a chat. So, the the idea of the Barnum term and uh, P. T. Barnum, of course, had the film made about him, The Greatest Showman. P. T. Barnum. Uh, I think it was Phineas Tiberium Barnum. He was the the showman that pretty much started the whole kind of circus thing. And the idea of the Barnum statements was a psychological thing brought up by a professor a couple of years later where he he gave his class a a series of quotations, a series of statements on this bit of paper. And what happened was he told everyone in the class that he had written this paper specifically about them. Every statement was just about them. And I'll, I'll even get the statements up. Hang on. The, uh, the Barnum statements. Let's bring them up. Rocky, I know that you're probably there thinking, <laughs> he's fallen for my ruse, all right? Don't mud wrestle a pig because they'll just drag you into the mud and the pig likes it. In this analogy, I'm the pig, okay? I like this. So here are the Barnum statements. The, the professor handed out this to all of his students and he said, please mark these statements on how accurate you believe they reflect you. And the statements were... You have a great need for other people to like or admire you. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you have not yet turned to your advantage. Disciplined and self-controlled aside, you tend to be somewhat insecure inside. You pride yourself as an independent thinker and do not accept other statements without satisfactory proof. Okay, yeah, you get the idea. They are super generic statements that anyone would actually want to apply to them because they'd be flattering if they did while having just enough self-awareness that they don't come across as arrogant. Anyway, the idea was that these statements came across and pretty much everyone went, oh yeah, yeah, that's so me. That's so me. So... Everyone wanted them to apply to them. It was just psychology. So when a company turn around to me and say, hey, we will sponsor you if you do this, 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 and this, the value to me is not necessarily in the money that they are giving me. It's in the longevity and the long-term survival of my channel having relevance into the future without being hemmed down by endless corporate bullshit. And that's worth a lot to me personally, So yeah, if I end up shooting myself in the foot, if I end up turning away big business because I don't like the way that business operates, great. That's why I've got the Patreon. The Patreon support literally allows me to turn away businesses that I don't believe have the best interests of the audience at heart. It's not the best interest of me. It's the best interest of the audience because my best interest is just take all the money. But if I do that, suddenly... I lose a load of, you know, long-term audience members, and that's not worth it to me. Businesses only have their best interest at heart. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. The example with statements can also be observed in horoscopes. Oh, God. Okay, so I always struggled remembering the difference between astrology and astronomy. 
astrology has an L in it, which stands for lie. Now, if you enjoy astrology because of the mythology behind it and the beauty of the stories, absolutely fine. You know, if you want to look into just the artistic merit of it, yes. But you don't need to base fact off it. Okay, I've got a fantastic chart that talks about, you know, the personalities that you're, you're built with and that you're born with. And it says the positions of the planet has no relevance on your personality. That's just my own personal feelings. You may think differently. I'm not going to mock you if you take it very seriously. But personally, yeah, someone's like, oh, God, he's a typical Sagittarius. Well, you would say that I'm a typical Sagittarius because actually I'm an Aries. OK, and this is a much more aggressive stance. See, I'm holding on to my beliefs and I'm pretty much saying exactly what I think without waiting for the general public appeal of it, which is what an Aries would do. And all of you are there going, oh, my God, that's so Aries. I'm not Aries. You just thought that it would fit. OK. I will kill everyone. Oh, such an Aries thing to say, without a doubt. But no, so astrology is based on kind of art and astronomy is based on looking at where stuff is in the sky and going, hmm, that's quite interesting. That's pretty much it. Uh, this was the whole Barnum statement thing. And this links back to the reason we got onto the statement. And again, if you're feeling personally attacked that I don't believe in the same kind of pseudoscience that brings you happiness... That's fine. I'm not saying you're wrong for believing in it. I'm just saying appreciate the artwork from it. I don't believe that a lot of the myths and legends are real, but I still appreciate the beauty that a myth and a legend and a story can have. Do I believe there was an actual Minotaur in a labyrinth? No. But do I think that the story of the Minotaur in the labyrinth is beautiful? Hell yeah. Absolutely. That's fantastic. We share our history and our beliefs through stories. And sometimes we're not sharing factual history. We're sharing philosophical history. We're sharing ideas. We're sharing, you know, the kind of the the core tenets that make us as a community what we are and what we value. So it's OK to share these kind of things because they are still fantastically interesting. But what I would appreciate, I would very, very much appreciate if horoscopes were more specific. Like, if I open up a horoscope in one of those weekly TV mags that for some reason they have at the end of Lidl, you know, you, you stand there waiting in the Lidl or the Aldi queue, and then to the side there's a rack of magazines, and they're like, TV Weekly! And you open it, and it's a horoscope, and it's like, Libra, you will die today. I'd be like, I appreciate the how specific you've been with that. That's much, much more on the nose. Okay. If you open it, it's like, good things are coming your way. And I walk outside and find like a, like a penny on the floor. I'd be thinking, oh, that's a shame. I was kind of hoping that, uh, that you know, I'd, I'd, it'd be more than that. <laughs> and you deserve it. Rocky, I didn't get the response from you I wanted. Oh, I'm sorry, Rocky. What was the, um... Rocky, I'm going to be honest. I totally forgot we were doing a thing. Um, you, we, we were talking about, what were we talking about? Barnum statements? And then we were talking about something else. Can you just, just catch me up to where we were, mate? Just give me the cliff notes. <laughs> just get me back to where you need me to be, and then we'll carry on. There was, there was a, I forgot, we had a whole thing going on, didn't we? I also forgot. All right, cool. Excellent. I love that. Whatever it was, I'm sure that we both felt very strongly about it, but now none of us can remember. Uh, that was like, was it an old Greek thing? I'm sure it was the, it was the Greeks, and they would, it might have been the Macedonians, they would debate something when drunk. And then a few days later, they would debate the same thing sober. And only when they agreed on both the drunk and the sober... It, the Babylonians, that was on, thank you. Only when they agreed on both interpretations did they you know, say, right, okay, we've got an answer. And I very much appreciate that. Was it the Persians? Let, let's just bring it back. Let's just bring it back, all of it. If we're going to have a debate, presidential debates, but everyone's pissed, that'd be great. House of Commons, but everyone is absolutely smashed. I imagine that's just what Australian Parliament's like all the time anyway, because those guys seem to at least make some kind of progress, which I appreciate. 
Have you ever watched like the open footage of the Australian kind of uh, collective parliament? It, it seems that everyone over there is a lot more chilled, or at least willing to insult the other person. And I appreciate that. There's, it sounds like, I mean, I don't know, I just don't live over there, but it genuinely does seem like they're at least getting something done. I love how getting smashed is so incredibly old that it's part of all of human written history. It should be. Yeah, it's, it's the one thing that brings us all together. Everyone collectively at some point needs to just, everyone gets, I mean, drink responsibly. I'm not obviously saying to go off and do something dangerous, but please do drink responsibly. In fact, you know, one thing that I value a lot is whenever I'm out with people and whether it's a, a gaming meetup or a Twitch thing or a YouTube thing, or even just you know, hanging out with casual friends, if someone offers a drink and someone else says no, everyone says, okay, no pressure. We're not forcing you to. We're absolutely not forcing you to. No one is, there's no peer pressure for this. Uh, Rookie says, you don't drink enough alcohol though, bruh, and keep it that way. I actually don't drink very much at all. I am a very cheap date. Okay, you take me out on a date, you come out with a tenner, I am dancing on the tables by the end of the night. All I need is two WKDs and a wink and I am yours. That's how it works. But I, I very much enjoy those fruity, brightly coloured, sugary drinks. Because they taste nice. I'm out with the lads and they're like, oh, do you want some bitter? I'm like, why would I use a terrible word to describe what I want? No, I want some sweet. That's what I want. I want something, you know, that's nice and sugary. I want something with a little umbrella in it. Cocktails. Oh, man. Okay, so in the UK, there is a chain of restaurants called the Cozy Club, and they sell... I'm, I know that I'm middle-classing myself here, but just indulge me. They sell the... Um, what was it called? The, the Cherry Bakewell cocktail. I swear to God, it tastes like a Cherry Bakewell, man. It tastes like a cake, and it you can't taste the alcohol, and you just... Oh, the Cozy Club breakfast... Look, if you're in the UK, if, if you're ever in the UK and you see me walking through town for some reason, just walk up to me and nod, and I will nod back, and then we will go to the Cozy Club for breakfast. Doesn't matter what time of day it is, it's 2am somewhere. We will go for breakfast. We'll have the Cozy Club sandwich and a Cherry Bakewell cocktail. That's the life I live. And if I can't live that life, why am I a YouTuber? What is the point? You know, what's it all about if I can't do that? Yeah. I'm sorry it's a joke. One small... F no. No, it's not. I live in the UK. Haven't heard of the Cozy Club. Oh, Cam. Cam, you're missing out. Uh, I don't think he is real. He is talking just like an AI. 